There is now no condemnation. I remember vividly a discussion I had with a brother pastor a couple years out of the seminary about the blessing to be given after communion at the Lord's table. I was attempting to convince him that he should stop saying, now this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ may bless you. I was trying to convince him that the use of the subjunctive was a use of doubt, an insertion of maybe, and a removal of the certainty which the Lord's Supper is very much there to confirm and give. It's also not what is written in our liturgy. Of course, I was trying to convince him to say something that is also not written in our liturgy. I say, now this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ will bless you. Now we can debate about the hymnal. I think we should keep it by and large. But the issue of what do we say when we are given to speak the gospel is one that we must not only debate about but defend. For the argument he brought against my position was not that it was not in the hymnal. The argument he brought against my position was his concern that somebody who had just received the Lord's Supper might have received it without faith and would believe my words about him being blessed. He was afraid that I would speak the gospel to someone and they would believe it. And all of our, I think, perhaps petty debates about antinomianism and legalism and who's who and what's what, the thing I see being lost in the churches of God in this nation is the good news that in Jesus Christ there is no condemnation now, and that this is a distinct message from everything else the world has to give. Of course there are people who will live licentiously, abusing this gospel, using it as an excuse for their flesh. But the one who lives to the flesh is self-condemned. They will do that to themselves whether we speak the gospel or not. The fear I have is that for the sake of the goats, we stop feeding the sheep. Those who will not abuse this gospel, but who will die without it. Paul doesn't seem to be afraid at this point in this open letter to the church in Rome. There is no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. And frankly, aside from the Lord's Supper, you got baptism, but aside from the Lord's Supper, where else can you know that you are in Christ Jesus? That is what the Lord's Supper is. It is Christ Jesus in you to make you in Christ Jesus one and all, the body of Christ, a gift, guarantee, and pledge of the very Holy Spirit who will raise you unbreakable from the dead because his body, which is now you, cannot be contained by the grave. And if we cannot promise that, if we cannot promise that faith alone in these words saves, and I don't know why we're not in Rome. The gospel does what the law cannot do. What can the law do? The law can restrain the edges of our licentiousness. It can bend and push back against our desire to build up ourselves one way or the other, whether by rank hedonism or by sanctimonious pietism. The law can do that just great. It's a great tool for attacking others. For that reason, it's a great tool for killing. But the Spirit is set on the things of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. The Spirit is life and peace. And the mind that is set on the flesh 
which I understand to be the mind that is set on self-justification. That mind is hostile to God, and no matter how much it might banter about the law, whatever law it might use, from karma to environmentalism to the Pope, no matter how much it boasts, it cannot keep it, because those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now the good news is that you are not in the flesh. Paul says so. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And of course, the ESV translates it, if in fact, although it could also read since indeed. Since indeed the spirit of God does dwell into you, because that is what he has guaranteed to you in his holy baptism of you, since that is an unalterable truth, which the world cannot steal from you and God will not remove from you. Therefore, you belong to him. And though your body does continue to waste away in its sin because of death, though the temptations of your flesh reel their ugly head from day to day and must indeed be put down, drowned, and died, though you walk in danger all the way and are at risk and jeopardy of rejecting your faith, by either using the gospel as your excuse for evil or by using the law to remove yourself from the gospel, though these all are true, nonetheless the promise, the Spirit, is life because of righteousness, and that righteousness is Christ Jesus. Not you, but yes, you because you are in Christ Jesus now. And because the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you, he will also give life to your mortal body through his Spirit who dwells in you. One of the great modern eras of Christianity, errors of Christianity, is the belief that salvation is the resurrection from the dead in heaven on the last day. The error is that that is half the truth. The full truth is that you are already raised. You are already resurrected from the dead. And that resurrection is nothing other than your faith alone. Your faith alone, which the evil one cannot overcome, and which has already overcome the world in the one who has risen from the dead for you. You are already raised and ascended to the right hand of Christ. How can you live in sin any longer? Well, according to the flesh you do, and according to the saint who waits patiently, you endure hate and fight against it. And according to God, you don't. It's all gone, buried in Jesus. There is now no condemnation. In the name of Jesus, amen.